Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. Most of us have read or at least heard of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. But by the time it appeared in 1850, its author, then 46 years old, had been writing and publishing since his graduation from college collections of short stories. It is one of these that we are about to bring you, written long before The Scarlet Letter and titled The Birthmark. Watch closely. The slender stalk shoots upward. The leaves unfold. And there, in the center, a perfect flower. Pluck it, my love. I dare not. I dare not touch it. It's magical. Our mystery drama, The Birthmark was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Tony Roberts and Gordon Heath. It is sponsored in part by General Electric Citizen Band Radios and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In the latter part of the 18th century, when this country was being born and the recent discovery of electricity and kindred mysteries of nature seemed to open paths into the region of miracle, it was not uncommon for the love of science to rival the love of woman. This is the story of one such rivalry. (laughs) The great man is late again. Late yesterday, late today, and probably late tomorrow. The laboratory awaits him. The distiller bubbles and waits. The retorts, the tubes, the cylinders, the crucibles, all are immaculate and sparkling and waiting for him. Soon the glow of the furnace will be red as rubies. All. All attend upon the appearance of the great man. And where is he? Good morning, Aminadab. A fine morning to you, master. I'm a trifle late. A new bridegroom is permitted a little tardiness. And how is the bride? Georgiana. Georgiana is... Do you know her, Aminadab? How should such a one as I know such a one as she? Have you ever seen her? From a distance only. Ah. I know what I hear. That she is adored by men. Envied by women. Mm, That's true. In short, perfection. That's not quite true. Oh? Did you not know that the beautiful, the exquisite Georgiana has a birthmark? I may have heard something. Mm, In the center of her cheek, her left cheek, a peculiar mark, woven deep, you might say, into the texture and substance of her face. The mark is shaped like a hand, a tiny hand. They say many an enamored swain would have risked his life to press his lips to that hand. Mm. I suppose that's true. Uh, Conversely, some ladies call it the bloody hand. They go so far as to say that it quite destroys the effect of her beauty, even renders her hideous. Of course, it is the ladies who say that. But the gentlemen, if their admiration is not actually heightened by the little flaw, they simply wish it would go away, so that this imperfect world might possess one living specimen of ideal loveliness. They say that is the feeling of some. Mm. It's beginning to be my own. Oh, before we were married, I gave it no thought. So caught up was I with her 
incomparable loveliness. But now, your feeling has changed? In the usual state of her complexion, which is a healthy though delicate bloom, the birthmark wears only a tint of deeper crimson, imperfectly defining its pygmy hand shaped amid the surrounding rosiness. When Georgiana blushes, as she so often does, it becomes more and more indistinct and finally vanishes amid the triumphant rush of blood that bathes her whole cheek with its brilliant glow. Ah, then... But if any shifting motion causes her to turn pale, there is the mark again, a crimson stain upon the virgin snow. Ah. Hmm. If only she were less beautiful, I could forgive it. She is otherwise so perfect. The birthmark disturbs you. I find it intolerable. Intolerable? And more so with each passing moment. The fatal flaw which nature stamps ineffaceably on all her productions. Why must it be so? I will not accept it. It sucks at the very heart of her beauty. It crushes my love for her. It poisons my marriage. I will not accept it. No. Never. What can you do, master, but accept it? Remove it. Remove it? I'm convinced it can be done. That you can do it? Would I entrust my beloved to the coarse, indifferent hands of another? Have you suggested this possibility to your wife? Shortly after we were married, yes. And what was her response? At first she smiled. Then she saw that I was serious. She blushed and said that her birthmark had often been considered one of her charms. And that she herself had been simple enough to imagine it might well be. And so it might. On another face than hers, it might indeed. But not on yours, I told her. You came so nearly perfect from the hand of nature, I said that the slightest possible defect shocks me as being the visible mark of earthly imperfection. That you should be shocked by her imperfection. Oh, my. Yes. Shocked. That was the word that did it. She burst into tears and said I could not possibly love what shocked me. Better we had never married, she said. But try as I might, I could not retract my words. God help me. God help us both. They were true. With that, the great man turns away from me. To hide tears, perhaps. Who knows? And he applies himself to a study of the notes for his current experiment. I dare not presume further upon our relationship by pursuing the topic. But the demeanor of the great man continues downcast through the next days. Nothing goes right. Nothing, nothing. Master, hmm? consider resting from your efforts for a brief span. <sighs> Very well. And uh, you will rest from yours. Agreed. We'll um, smoke a pipe together and try to cleanse our minds. Hmm. Sit down. Thank you, Master. You, you remember what we talked of a few days back? Your wife, her birthmark, the possibility of removing it. Yes, I remember too well. It occurs to me that things may be going poorly for you here in the laboratory because your mind is still occupied with that problem. My mind is obsessed with it, consumed by it. You cannot believe how it has taken over my thoughts. I am destroyed by my obsession with my beloved's birthmark and how to be rid of it. Have you spoken of it further to her? I cannot help it. I mean not to speak of it. Wrench my thoughts and my words away from it firmly, purposefully. But no matter what my intent, what my effort, I revert inevitably to the subject of the birthmark. A minute habit has become the central point of my existence. With the morning light, I open my eyes to my wife's face and see immediately the sign of imperfection. When we sit together at the evening hearth, my eyes wander stealthily to her cheek and behold, flickering with the blaze of the wood fire, the spectral hand. And is your young wife aware of your furtive spying? Unhappily, she is. 
Now she shudders at my gaze. Ah, uh, my poor master. The other night, I had a dream. You know, Aminadab, that I place great store by dreams and their meaning. Georgiana woke me and told me that I had cried out in my sleep, that I had shouted. It is in her heart now. We must have it out. She asked me, did I have any recollection of the dream that had caused me to utter those horrendous words? And did you? I told her no, and it was true. I had no remembrance whatsoever, though I might understandably have had a dream about the birthmark since before I fell asleep it had taken a firm hold on my musings. And you cannot remember the dream? No. And yet... Yes? And yet? Speaking with you here, now, uh, relaxed. Relaxed the way we are. Yes. There's a spark. There's a glimmer. Yes, master? You. You were in my dream, Aminadab. I, master? Yes. You. You and I were together. We... We were attempting an operation for the removal of the crimson hand. Oh, master. But the deeper went the knife, the deeper sank the little hand, until, at length, its tiny grasp caught hold upon her heart. Master, for the love of God. But even then, even then, I was resolved, inexorably resolved, to cut it out or wrench it away. Oh, master. What's to be done? I must tell Georgiana the dream. Must you? Truth finds its way to the mind close muffled in robes of sleep. Until now, I had not known of the absolute tyranny this one idea has had over my mind. Until now, I have not known the lengths I might go to to give myself peace. Then you are determined... I am a scientist, Aminadab. I cannot think of myself as anything else. And science demands that we follow every scrap of revealed truth, no matter where it leads. The great man sits by the stove. His notebooks have not been opened. The tubes and retorts have not been touched. The chemicals sit upon the shelf. I move quietly about the laboratory. He seems not to know I am here. Master. Oh. Oh, I mean it, Dad. You're not disposed to continue the experiment we started some weeks past? Oh, I cannot even remember it. Oh, Master. I mean it, Dad. I have told Georgiana the dream. And what did she respond, if I may ask? She said... She said... Aylmer... I know not what may be the cost to rid me of this fatal birthmark. Perhaps its removal may cause cureless deformity. Or it may be that the stain goes deep as life itself. Besides, do we know that a possibility even exists of unclasping the grip of this little hand which was laid upon me before I came into the world? All through. What could you say? I said what I believe. That I am convinced of the perfect practicability of its removal. And then she said, Aylmer, let the attempt be made. Danger is nothing to me. Life is a burden while this hateful mark makes me the object of your horror and disgust. Aylmer, she said, remove this dreadful hand or take my wretched life. Brave woman. Spare me not, Aylmer, though you should find the birthmark in my heart. And so I kissed her on the cheek, her right cheek, not the cheek that bore the impress of the crimson hand. I tremble for my master. I tremble for his bride. I think I tremble for myself, for I am not of Aylmer's stature. I am but a poor clod, meant to serve, never to command, meant to assist, never to initiate. Yet, where he leads, I must follow.
Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. Shakespeare wrote that in a sonnet. What would he say of a birthmark in the shape of a tiny hand and the alteration necessary to remove it and the insistent desire to do away with it? We'll return shortly with Act Two. No sooner had the great scientist married the most beautiful of women than his critical eye fastened upon a flaw in her beauty, a tiny birthmark in the shape of a hand which glowed fiery red against the pallor of one cheek. Haunted by the desire to erase the slight blemish, he has attained her consent to attempt the erasure himself, no matter what the consequence. All work on our current experiments has been suspended for a full two weeks. We are in a fever of remodeling and refurbishing. You must understand that before he married the lovely Georgiana, my master had occupied certain extensive inner chambers connected to his laboratory. Here he had lived during his toilsome youth, while he made those discoveries that had roused the admiration of all the learned societies in Europe. Now he proposed to use these apartments for another purpose. It's a perfect plan, I mean, Adam. It will give me the opportunity for the intense thought and constant watchfulness the coming operation will require. And Georgiana will enjoy the perfect repose essential to its success. You will bring her here? We will live in the inner chambers together, seclude ourselves there. She will not enter the working laboratory until the crucial day. But the adjacent rooms will be a sort of private paradise. I want the walls hung with the most gorgeous curtains. I shall select them myself, since you are scarcely capable. Uh, quite so. It will be all grandeur and grace. The draperies will fall from ceiling to floor in rich and ponderous folds, concealing all angles and straight lines. The sunshine will be excluded, lest it interfere with my chemical processes. But there will be, instead, the most beautiful perfumed lamps emitting flames of various hues uniting all in a soft impurpled radiance you follow me yes master those smoky dingy somber rooms will change to an exquisite abode for the loveliest of women i can scarce contain my excitement my palms sweat my breath comes rapidly my eyes are glazed with anticipation, for soon the door will open and the fabled Georgiana will walk through it. I shall see her. Yes, I, I, the stunted, the ugly, the hairy, the grimy, the earthy, shall see her. I shall see her close. Enter, my love. What do you think of your new abode? Exquisite. My dear, you're trembling. It can't be helped. Noblest, dearest, tenderest wife. Do not doubt my power. I have given this matter the deepest thought. I know. Then why do you tremble? Why are you so cold? Why so pale? You're white as a ghost, my Am love. I? Let me reassure you, dear heart. Come into my arms. Oh, Ilma. There, now. No. Oh, do not turn away. Ilma. A minute, Ab. I'm right here, Master. Take her to the boudoir. As Ilma moved close to take her in his arms, the birthmark glowed scarlet on her white cheek, and even as he tried to embrace her, so intense was the glow that he could not hold back a strong, convulsive shudder. Seeing the revulsion on her husband's face, Georgiana had cried out and fainted. Now I pick up her still form, cradle it gently in my strong arms, and gently carry it to the boudoir. At last, I stare down into that ineffably lovely face. It is closer to mine than it will ever be again. 
and I drink in its beauty as I muse to myself. Were she my wife, I should never part with that birthmark. Never. I have hardly left her bedside. Elma has been working feverishly in the laboratory proper, only summoning me when he needed my brute strength or my delicate accuracy. His slender finger and pale intellectual face bend over his notes, while I, bulky, ungainly, grimed with the vapors of the furnace, crouch in a corner of her boudoir. That is where I am when she wakes from her faint. Elma! Oh, Elma! Mistress. What? Oh. Don't be frightened, mistress. Where is my husband? In his laboratory. Hard at work. Oh, yes. The operation to remove this. Oh, mistress, fear not. Who are you? His servant, Aminadab. Privileged to be his assistant from time to time when he needs my mechanical readiness. But you must have more than that, Aminadab. I have a skill an ability to execute the details of my master's experiments. But I assure you, mistress, I have not the wit to comprehend the slightest details of any of those experiments. But what do you think of this, this uh, latest of his experiments? The removal of the little hand, you mean, that rests upon your cheek? And gives him no rest until he exorcises it. Well, tell me. I really want to know. Mistress, there is a truth which all seekers stumble upon sooner or later. And what is that? Our great creative mother, while she amuses us by apparently working in the broadest sunshine, is yet severely careful to keep her own secrets. And despite her pretended openness, shows us nothing but results. She permits us to mar but seldom to mend, and on no account to make. I cannot tell if my words have meaning for her. Indeed, I do not know myself the precise significance of what I say. The days drag on, and I am living in a fever of dread and anticipation. I am living within the hearts of both my master and my mistress. In the intervals of study and experiment, he comes to her flushed and exhausted and speaks glowingly of the resources of his art. This small vial contains a gentle but powerful fragrance which can impregnate all the breezes that blow across a kingdom. And this... This gold-colored liquid in a crystal vial? Oh, that. That is the most precious poison ever concocted. By its aid, I could apportion the lifetime of any mortal at whom you might point your finger. The strength of the dose would determine whether he were to linger out years or drop dead in the midst of a breath. Elmer, you chill me to the marrow of my bones. Why do you keep such a fearful drug? Trust me, my beloved, trust me. I do trust you. But why Look do... here. Here is a powerful cosmetic. With a few drops in a vase of water, freckles may be washed away as easily as the hands are cleansed. A stronger infusion would take the blood out of the cheek and leave the rosiest beauty a pale ghost. Is it with this lotion that you intend to bathe my cheek? Oh, no, my darling. No, this is only superficial. Your case demands a remedy that shall go deeper. Far deeper, my sweet girl. Far, far deeper. He has been locked in his laboratory for a full week now, absorbed in his labors. I am crouched in the corner of her boudoir, as I always am when not actively assisting him. She is reading. Beside her bed are ponderous volumes. I recognize them as coming from his scientific library. I dare to approach her where she lies. Have you finished with these books, mistress? Those? Oh, yes. Shall I return them to the shelves? If you like. Ah, uh, a 
Albertus Magnus, Cornelius Agrippa. You have been reading the antique naturalists. Paracelsus and the rent. Paracelsus, the great Swiss physician and philosopher of the 16th century. He who speaks of the portals of man's deep within. When one is conquered or thrown off the thraldom of matter in his own body. You have studied him well, mistress. Yeah. But this, the value I am perusing now, this is my favorite. Why? Why, it is the master's own folio. He gave it to me to read. Oh, it's a rare privilege, mistress, to read in that folio. He has recorded there every experiment of his scientific career, its original aim, the methods for its development, and its final success or failure. It is the history and emblem of his life. She reads on. I return to my corner. She grows more and more absorbed in the folio. The color comes and goes in her face. The birthmark appears and disappears as her cheek alternately flushes into pales. Then, all at once... A minute up. Yes, mistress. You know that each time he has been with me here, he has inquired as to my sensations whether the confinement of the room and the temperature of the atmosphere agree with me. Yes, mistress. I've begun to think that I'm being subjected to certain influences that I have been for some time. What influences? I'm not sure. Nor am I sure how they are brought to bear, whether breathed in with the fragrant air or taken with my food. Merely your fancy, perhaps? Perhaps. But if so, then I have another fancy. And what is that? That there is a... Um, stirring in my system a strange, indefinite sensation creeping through my veins, tingling half painfully, half pleasurably at my heart. Oh, mistress. Still, when I dare to look into the mirror, there I behold myself, pale as a white rose, still with the crimson birthmark stamped upon my cheek. And I hate it. I hate it. Not even my husband now hates it so much as I. Mistress, sweet mistress. And another thing, something I've told no one, not even Elmer. Yes, mistress. These past few hours, two or... Or three, perhaps. I've noticed a sensation in the awful birthmark itself. Is it painful? No, not painful. But it induces a certain restlessness throughout my system. A stirring, craving, a desire to... to... I'm going in to venture into the laboratory where my husband works. Wait. Don't try to stop me. Don't direct him. I must. I must. Through the open door, I can see him. Pale as death. Anxious and absorbed as he hangs over the distiller. As though it depended upon his utmost watchfulness. Whether or not the liquid within would be the draft of immortal happiness or eternal despair. The world of science is one I know little of. The reasoning and the deductions of great scientists are beyond my comprehension. But this I do know. All their arduous journeys to logical deductions, all their fevered experiments along the way, all these descend directly from the ancient fervid belief in magic. We shall return to you presently with the concluding act. Aylmer has installed his young wife, Georgiana, in the inner chambers adjoining his laboratory. When, attempting to reassure her, he leaned to embrace her, he was struck afresh with horror at the sight of the little red birthmark that tainted the perfection of her cheek. Seeing his revulsion, Georgiana fainted, and it was Aylmer's servant, Aminadab, who carried her to the sumptuous boudoir so lovingly prepared for her. 
Since that moment, Aminadab has spent every free moment with Georgiana. Until, at last... Aminadab, I'm venturing into the laboratory. Wait, mistress. Don't try to stop me. Don't interrupt I him. I must. I... Elma. What? Who dared? Georgiana. Why have you come here? It was necessary. Have you no trust in your husband? Oh, Elma. Will you throw the blight of that fateful birthmark over my labors? Elma, no, no. Go, woman, go. I implore you, tell me all the risk we run. No, Georgiana. Fear not that I shall shrink. My share in it is far less than your own. I can conceal nothing from you, nor will I. I ask no more than that, nor ever did. Know then that this crimson hand upon your cheek, superficial as it seems has clutched its grasp into your being with a strength of which I had no previous conception. I've already administered agents powerful enough to do everything but change your entire physical system. Only one thing remains to be tried. Only one? If that fails us, we are ruined. But why did you hesitate to tell me this? Because, Georgiana, there is danger... Danger. There is but one danger. That this horrible stigma shall be left upon my cheek. Remove it. Whatever the cost, remove it or we shall both go mad. Heaven knows your words are true. Now, my dear one, return to your boudoir. In a short while, all will be tested. All this I watch from the door of the boudoir. Now he conducts her to her bed. And I watch this, too. He takes leave of her with a solemn tenderness which speaks far more than words. How much is now at stake? Aminadab. Aminadab, are you here? I am here, mistress. What is this that hangs over my head. A mirror, mistress. But it is a scant meter from my face. It is a mirror, mistress. The master bade me place it there. Oh. Oh, I see now. I see my face, and I see the despicable birthmark as well. Do not dwell upon it. No. I shall muse upon more easeful things. My husband, for example. A great man. His character. His love for me. He does indeed love you. I never knew till now how much he loves me. My heart is exultant, Aminadab, even though it trembles. At the purity, the loftiness of his love. It will accept nothing less than perfection. Oh, mistress. With my whole soul. I pray that for a single moment I may satisfy his highest and deepest conception. Longer than a moment I know it not possible to be. For his spirit is ever on the march, ever ascending, each instant requiring something that lies beyond the scope of the instant before. Georgiana. My dear. Elmer. The concoction of the draft has been perfect. Unless all my science has deceived me, it cannot fail. Were it not for you, my dearest husband, I might wish to put off my birthmark of mortality by relinquishing mortality itself. Life is a sad possession to those who have attained the degree of moral advancement at which I stand. Were I weaker and blinder, it might be happiness. Were I stronger, it might be endured, but being what I find myself to be, methinks I am of all mortals, the most fit to die. Why do we speak of dying? The draft cannot fail. Give me the goblet. Georgiana. I joyfully stake all upon your word. Drink, then. Drink. The liquid is like water from a heavenly fountain. 
Now, my dearest, let me sleep. My earthly senses are closing over my spirit like the leaves around the heart of a rose at sunset. A minute, Ab. Yes, Buster. Oh, there you are. Come here. Yes, Buster. Uh, fetch me my folio volume. It is right there, Master, by her bed. She was reading in it. Uh, you will inscribe in it what I dictate. I shall watch her for symptoms and relay them to you. Yes, Master. I am ready. Her cheeks are flushed. Cheeks flushed. Be sure to note down the precise time of each entry. Yes, Master. Breath is slightly irregular. Slightly irregular breath. Left eyelid quivers. Left eyelid. A tremor, a tremor barely perceptible, but a tremor through the frame. All the while, the great man fails not to gaze at the fatal crimson hand, and not without a shudder of disgust. You mean it, Ab? Do my eyes deceive me? Is the crimson hand more faintly outlined? It has faded a trifle, Master. Yet, yet she is pale as ever. But the birthmark is less distinct. I shall conquer. I shall conquer. I know it. I shall conquer. The presence of the scarlet hand has been awful. God knows. But its departure is more awful still. Watch the stain of a rainbow fade out of the sky. And you will know of the passing of the birthmark. By heaven, it is well nigh gone. I can scarcely trace it now. Success! Success! Yes, success. Now it is like the faintest rose color. The lightest flush of blood across her cheek would overcome it. But she is so pale. Draw the window curtain. Suffer the light of natural day to fall into the room and rest upon her cheek. Yes, master. I mean it, Al. You'll serve me well. You and I, matter and spirit, earth and heaven, both have done their part in this. <laughs> laugh, you thing of the senses. You have earned the right to laugh, and so have I. Success is ours, yours and mine. His wild exclamations break her sleep. Slowly she uncloses her eyes and gazes into the mirror above her face, which she has arranged for and I have set up. A faint smile flits over her lips when she recognizes how barely perceptible is now the crimson hand which had once blazed forth with such disastrous brilliance as to frighten away their happiness. But now her eyes seek his face with a look of trouble and anxiety. My poor Elmer. Poor? Nay, richest, happiest. Most favored. Dear love. My peerless bride, it is successful. Dearest. Husband. You are perfect. You have aimed loftily. You have done nobly. Georgiana, my <laughs> precious wife. Oh, Elmer. Dearest Elmer. I am dying. <laughs> Alas, it is too true. The fatal hand has grappled with the mystery of life, had been the bond by which an angelic spirit kept itself in union with a mortal frame. The last crimson tint of the birthmark, that sole token of human imperfection, fades from her cheek. My master stares with eyes that seem to see nothing save the spot where it had been and is no more. He is still staring down into her face when something causes me to glance upward to a spot just above her recumbent form. A puff of smoke, a fragment of cloud vapor. What is it that seems to rise from her body Linger a moment near him, then take its flight toward heaven. 
she's dead. She's lost to me forever. Where did I fail? Where did I go astray? <laughs> How can you laugh? You lump of earth. You mass of clay. Oh, man of intellect. Oh, great man of science. Oh, eminent philosopher who seeks to penetrate every secret of our great mother. You see before you the last result of your impudence. Thus ever does the gross fatality of earth exult in its invariable triumph over the immortal essence. I only tried had you, oh great man, reached a profounder wisdom. You need not thus have flung away the happiness which would have woven your mortal life of the self-same texture with the celestial. I only wish... A momentary circumstance was too strong for you. You did not look beyond the shadowy scope of time. And living once and for all in eternity, you failed to find the perfect future in the present. I pity you, great man. From the depths of my soul. You loved her. You loved her. You. I loved her. Yes. Just as she was. I loved her. Just as God sent her into this world. I loved her. And would have loved her all my days. What have I done? What have I done? What men of your stamp must inevitably do. You have pursued your dream, followed your star. That is what you have done, master. Given what you are, that is what you must always do. The story of the birthmark was written over a hundred years ago at a time when the worship of science was sweeping over the world. In the last century, this worship has grown to a frenzy. We bow before its power. We refuse to believe that it cannot resolve all our woes. When will we learn that science is not a god, that it was never meant to be worshipped, that it is our servant only, never our master. I'll be back shortly. Though Nathaniel Hawthorne lived in relative obscurity until the Scarlet Letter made him famous, he was never ignored by his fellow writers. Longfellow admired him hugely, and so did Herman Melville. And Edgar Allan Poe called him the example par excellence of the privately admired and publicly unappreciated man of genius. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Gordon Heath, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching